Thomas Hobbes, in his interesting work, Leviathan, gave an account of why he believed society needs rules, and in particular, society needs rulers. Um, I'll quote, During the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition called war. And such a war as if of every man against every man. To this war of every man against every man, this also in consequent, that nothing can be unjust. The notions of right and wrong, justice and injustice, have there no place. Where there is no common power, there is no law. Where no law, no injustice. Force and fraud are in war the cardinal virtues. No arts, no letters, no society. And which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. I think we're all familiar with that quote. It's uh, the classical case for uh, the absolutist state, the state that just tells everybody what to do. And if you can't get people to agree, you bang their heads together and say, now you've just agreed. I'm bigger than you are. You do as I say. Hobbes was writing in a period when uh, England had just experienced a hellish civil war. And civil wars are always awful. Um, and he was saying, this is what we have to do to avoid a civil war. Another one, we need an absolute monarch, a powerful king, a powerful, at least a powerful central government that just keeps everybody uh, in check, keeps our natural tendencies towards mutual destruction or self-destruction uh, in check. He wasn't just saying that um, uh, a strong ruler is just the, a wonderful idea, far from it. He was saying without a strong ruler, this is what we get. We get Hobbesian chaos. Uh, I would actually say that the law is there for the same purpose. It's not so much there because we want to do the right thing with the law, but we want to prevent the wrong thing from being done. Now, we can't agree on what the wrong thing is, but generally society has some vague idea as to what it expects of people, what it expects people to do, and in particular, what it expects people not to do. Uh, oftentimes, uh, morality is mixed in with the law, but it's not the central driving force behind it. Um, I've got a couple of books here, The World of Athens and The World of Rome, which uh, deal thoroughly with uh, uh, ancient Greek and Roman notions of the law, and you'd be surprised how little morality or how, how little altruism there is in Roman and Greek law. There's even less in uh, the uh, law codes that came to us from um, uh, the Middle East, such as the Code of Hammurabi, uh, and uh, from India, the laws of Manu. They're basically just a series of laws that say, this is how we manage society, this is how we limit the power of rulers, when it is time for their powers to be limited. Usually in emergencies, as Hobbes says, the rulers get uh, absolutely... Uh, complete power over everything. Uh, at no point, um, up until very recently, was the idea uh, implicit in our laws that laws are there to actually intervene to do the right thing, and it's created all of its own problems. Um, the problem which is with us to this day. Look at uh, Obama and uh, Obamacare. There's a big debate going on in the United States and people are saying, and they have some right on their side, that that's not what government is for. Government is there to restrain people, not to actively promote the good. Um, as a Canadian, of course, I totally agree with Obama, but what goes on in the United States is my own business. I'm just pointing out what the actual driving force is behind the law. Uh, as it has developed in human society. According to the antinatalist view of law, law should be there to prevent harm. Now, that's always a, a very good idea to preempt someone being harmed, but that's not really what the law does. If you actually look at the law in action, what the law does is it resolves disputes. It doesn't resolve them to everyone's satisfaction. Somebody's going to get mad when the judge rules or the jury rules. 
Uh, in other words, they're not going to get everything they wanted, or they're going to <laughs> end up getting a lot <laughs> more than they wanted, i.e. a prison sentence or whatever, heavy fine. Um, but one has to be careful of injecting too much morality into the law, because you do end up in uh, intellectual, moral, and philosophical dead ends, like, um, like antinatalism. Uh, if um, the golden rule is taken to its extreme, uh, then, or if perhaps even more than the golden rule, if the idea of uh, complete nonviolence is taken to its extreme, then yes, uh, what you get is you get a rational justification for antinatalism and the prevention of sentience. Um, but again, that's there's, there's, there can be too much of anything, and I would say that an excess of altruism uh, ends up uh, in things like antinatalism. You argue life out of existence. I take the view that we have to understand the difference between the law and morality. Um, my, again, classic case of that is Socrates, who was held up in the ancient world as a supremely moral man after he was dead, of course. Um, and one of the great moralities, one of the great uh, um, uh, demonstrations of this was his death. He was wrongly convicted, uh, condemned to death, and yet his enemies thought he was just going to skip town because he wasn't guarded all that, uh, all that carefully, that he could have just as easily fled after uh, he was condemned to death. But no, he said, I have to obey the laws of my country. I'll drink the hemlock. And he did. <clears throat> throughout his life he was known for someone who was quite diligent in his religious duties and his political duties. He'd served on a, on a jury and spoken up um, uh, during an extremely uh, controversial and divisive debate. And he'd, he'd spoken up in favor of the minority position where um, a bunch of people were going to be condemned to death. Uh, he'd spoken up against this. He was also known as a very brave soldier in Athens' many wars. He lived in the world. He lived in the world and he followed society's rules. Um, but he did say that morality, since it exists ultimately here, is something that we must cultivate. We must have a balance between living in the world and uh, getting too much ensnared in it. We have to understand that society needs rules and that we, in as much as we're capable of of it, um, have an imperative to act morally, and m more importantly, to think morally, because that's uh, something we can always do. We can't always act morally, but we can think morally. Uh, but at the same time, one must understand that applying morality to the human condition, applying morality to uh, general society, is almost impossible. And if you attempt to do it, then you stray into lunatic territory, uh, or at least into extremist territory. It's not going to work. Um, every time that I believe that we've attempted to do that, we've ended up with a guillotine in the town square. Um, human society is not perfect, and it's not going to be perfect. Um, I can't imagine it being perfected in my lifetime, I'll put it that way. So in the meantime, we have to deal with what we've got. And what we've got is what we've got. And I, I also, like Socrates, believe that we have to live in this world, we have to change it in the ways that we can, but ultimately we have to come to terms with it um, more than uh, we have to, we can, we're able to force it to come to terms with morality. It's not going to work. Um, does that mean that, uh, that uh, one must give up one in favor of the other? Do you have to give up any idealism in favor of living in the world? Or do you have to give up um, any sort of uh, practicality and in, in favor of idealism? I think that both are possible. It's not easy, but it can be done. Um, the extreme case of somebody who actually wants to uh, uh, give up all notions of practicality in favor of pure morality is the Jane who sits down, refuses to accept reality, and fasts himself or herself to death. Uh, the extreme case of somebody who wants to give up all uh, uh, morality and just accept the world and its contradictions and try and uh, do the best uh, that one can by them is, I don't know, Al Capone or something like that. I didn't create the world. The world is the way it is, and I'm simply benefiting from all its imperfections, and I'm just benefiting better than anybody else does. That's why people call me a criminal or a dictator or whatever you want to call it. I think that, again, it's a question of balance. 
we have to be in the game, but not of the game. I don't care if that sounds like airy-fairy Buddhist talk. Um, I'm not a Buddhist. I have to point that out occasionally. That's a, a, a trinket that I brought back from a trip to Southeast Asia a while back. But um, anyway, it's, uh, it's an interesting debate. What is the law for? And um, I think that it's one that's going to be going on for quite some time, perhaps even here on YouTube, perhaps in the context of this discussion, this ongoing discussion of antinatalism. The law is there as a referee. The law is there because without it, we get chaos. The law, to a certain extent, can be used to um, enforce the good, to prevent harm, to a certain extent. But if you decide that that's the central uh, purpose of the law, well, okay, you've got to rewrite the entire thing from the beginning. Thank you.